Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Alice Bryant. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, China's space program has become the first to land a spacecraft on the so-called dark side of the moon. The landing on Thursday brought the country closer to its goal of becoming a space power. The China National Space Administration said the landing of the Chang'e 4 spacecraft at 10.26 in the morning Beijing time has opened up a new chapter in human lunar exploration. Chang'e 4 sent a picture taken at 11.40 in the morning back to Earth. It shows a small crater and an empty surface that appears to be lit by a light from the Lunar Explorer. The name Chang'e comes from a Chinese goddess that many Chinese believe has lived on the moon for thousands of years. The landing is an example of China's growing desire to compete with the American, Russian, and European space programs. China also wants to strengthen its position as a regional and international power. Soon after President Xi Jinping took office in 2013, he said, the space dream is part of the dream to make China stronger. Ho Shi Yun is a professor at Nanjing University's School of Astronomy and Space Science. He told the Associated Press, On the whole, China's space technology still lags behind the West. But with the landing on the far side of the moon, we have raced to the front. He added that China plans to explore Mars, Jupiter, and asteroids in the future. There's no doubt that our nation will go farther and farther, he said. In 2013, Chang'e 3 made the first moon landing since the former Soviet Union's Luna 24 in 1976. The United States is the only country that has successfully sent a person to the moon. But China is considering a crewed mission as well. For now, China plans to send a Chang'e 5 spacecraft to the moon next year and have it return to Earth with collected particles. The moon's far side is not always dark, but it is often called the dark side because it faces away from Earth and little is known about it. Chang'e 4 will make astronomical observations and examine the structure and mineral composition of the ground above and below the surface. Yu Guabin is a Chang'e 4 mission spokesman. He said, The far side of the moon is a rare, quiet place that is free from interference from radio signals from Earth. He added, the mission will provide important information for studying the origin of stars and nebula evolution. The official Xinhua News Agency reported Yu's comments. 
One difficulty of operating on the far side of the moon is communicating with Earth. Last May, China launched a satellite so that Chang'e 4 could send back information. China carried out its first crewed space mission in 2003. It became only the third country to do so after Russia and the United States. China has two space stations in orbit and plans to launch a Mars exploration vehicle in the mid-2020s. Its space program suffered a rare delay last year with the failed launch of its Long March 5 rocket. In the humorous American television program, Seinfeld, the characters often find themselves in strange situations because of small communication failures. These little misunderstandings grow to the point of total confusion. For example, in one show, Jerry and George take a limousine or limo meant for other passengers. They act like they are those passengers by using their names. Listen to George express excitement about what they have done. This is incredible. This is one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life. I'm going to call my mother. What's going on? Oh, I'm in a limo. Hello, Ma. It's me. Guess where I am? In the back of a limo. Now nobody died. Some of the planned passengers later unexpectedly get in the limo and begin to make unusual comments. Jerry and George are unsure what these comments mean, but they soon find out they are among very, very bad people. On television, communication failures can make for funny stories, but in real life, you probably want to avoid such confusion. In today's program, we will tell you how to get clarification on what someone has said or written. When you ask someone for clarification, you are asking them to say something in a different way or provide more information so that you understand them better. This is different from asking a person to repeat something. The person might not have explained themselves clearly, for example, or maybe they used difficult language, or maybe you think you know what the person means but want to make sure that you are correct. Here is how you can respectfully get the information that you need. The first step is to tell the person that you are not sure that you have understood them fully. Let's listen to a few useful phrases. I'm sorry, but I'm not sure that I understand. Sorry, I'm not sure that I know what you mean. Sorry, but I don't quite follow you. Using the word that in two of the phrases is more suited for formal written communication, such as work-related emails. Other times, you may understand part of what someone has said, but need clarity on another part. In such situations, you can be more exact. Let's hear a few examples. I'm sorry, but I'm not sure I understand what you mean by tech giants. Sorry, but I don't quite follow what you're saying about the new policy. 
After you express your lack of understanding, the next step is to ask the person to clarify what they have said. Here are some phrases you can use. For many of them, you can use can or could, with could being a little more formal. Could you say it in another way? Can you clarify that for me? Could you rephrase that? When you say, do you mean... The phrase, when you say, do you mean, of course, is not a complete sentence. Here is how it sounds when complete. When you say workers are on furlough, do you mean they're temporarily laid off from work? Other times, you may simply need more information or a helpful example. In such situations, the following are useful. Could you be more specific? Can you give me an example? Could you elaborate on that? Could you elaborate on that is usually more suited to formal situations, such as in the workplace. Okay, we have talked about the two steps, but we haven't yet put them together. Let's do that now. Listen to someone expressing lack of understanding and asking for clarification. I'm sorry, but I'm not sure I understand. When you say workers are on furlough, do you mean they're temporarily laid off from work? Here's another example. Sorry, but I don't quite follow what you're saying about the new policy. Could you be more specific about gift card restrictions? There are some social or professional situations in which you may want to avoid directly saying you haven't understood. In such cases, you can check your understanding by rephrasing what the person said. For instance, you might say, let me see if I understood you correctly. You are saying that... Let me see if I understood you correctly. You're saying that airport security workers are now working without pay? Here is a very similar phrase. If I understand you correctly, you're saying that... If I understand you correctly, you're saying that airport security workers are now working without pay? Another phrase you might use is, So what you're saying is... So what you're saying is that some hotels offer discounts to guests for not using their cell phones? Or you might say, so, in other words, which we usually use when we are restating something in a simpler way. So in other words, complex carbohydrates are starches that have not been refined. After the person clarifies themselves, you can let them know that you now understand and are thankful. Have a listen. I got it. Thank you. Ah, uh, I see. Thanks for clarifying. Now I understand. Thanks a lot. There are other times when someone will ask you for clarification. In such cases, phrases like these can introduce what you want to say. In other words, let me clarify that. To put it another way, of course, there are many ways to ask for or offer clarification, but we hope these examples help. I'm Alice Bryant.
VOA Learning English. Welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. Last time, we talked about the election of Martin Van Buren as the eighth president of the United States. Van Buren had served as President Andrew Jackson's Secretary of State and later his vice president. Jackson asked his political party, the Democrats, to nominate Van Buren as their presidential candidate in the 1836 election. The Whig party was against him, but their opposition was divided. Van Buren won the election easily. Jackson stood beside Van Buren as the new president was sworn in at the Capitol building in Washington. Physically, the two men were very different. Jackson was tall, with long white hair that flowed back over his head. Jackson's health had been poor during the last few months he spent in the White House. He seemed tired. There was almost no color in his face. Van Buren was much shorter than Jackson and had much less hair. His eyes were brighter than those of the old man next to him. In his inaugural speech, Van Buren noted that he was the first American born after the revolution to become president of the United States. He was also the first president who was not from a British family. His family was Dutch. Van Buren said he felt he belonged to a later age. He called for more unity among Democrats of the North and South. He said better times were ahead for the country. Martin Van Buren had a poor education as a boy. He went to school only for a few years. His father was a farmer and hotel keeper at a small town in New York State. Politicians, including Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, had sometimes visited the hotel. By listening to them and others, the future president learned about politics. Eventually, Van Buren studied in a law office and became a lawyer. In the first years of his career, he defended tenants and renters who were fighting large plantation owners for their land. As a result, he developed a reputation for helping the common man. Van Buren became a local official and then a senator and governor of New York. When he was 24, he married a young woman he had grown up with but she died of tuberculosis after 12 years, leaving him with four sons. And after that, he was known as quite charming among the ladies, as they said in those days. Historian Joel Silby is an expert on Martin Van Buren. Mr. Silby says most people who knew Van Buren liked him. He seemed warm and friendly. He tried to keep his political life and his social life separate. It was not unusual to see him exchange handshakes, smiles, and jokes with men who were his political enemies. But he did not have a national reputation like Andrew Jackson had. What he was known for and what got him into the vice presidency and then the presidency was that he was Jackson's right-hand man. Van Buren had been president for just a few days when an economic crisis struck the country. The crisis had been building for months. It really began with the death of the Bank of the United States more than a year before. The bank had been so strong that it was able to control the economy throughout most of the country. It also helped control smaller state banks. It refused to accept the notes or paper money of these banks unless the state banks could exchange the paper 
for gold or silver money. President Jackson had opposed the Bank of the United States. He vetoed a bill that would have continued it. After the powerful bank closed, a number of new state banks opened. All of them produced large amounts of paper money, many times the amount they could exchange for gold or silver. Business speculators used much of this paper money to buy land from the government. These men bought the land, held it for a while, then sold it for more than they paid. The government soon found itself with millions of dollars of paper money of questionable value. To stop these activities, Jackson had ordered only gold or silver payments for government land. But many banks did not have enough gold to cover the paper notes. At the same time, American agriculture was having trouble. In 1835 and 1837, many crops failed. American traders had to import farm products from Europe, and they had to pay for them in gold or silver. In the spring of 1837, just as Martin Van Buren was taking office, the demand on banks for gold and silver grew too heavy. The banks stopped honoring their promises to exchange their paper money for gold. They said the suspension was just temporary, that it was necessary to stop for a while all payments in gold or silver. The crisis became worse. Many of the weaker state banks closed. Those that stayed open had almost no money to lend. Businessmen could not pay back money they owed the banks, and they could not get loans to keep their businesses open. Many factories closed. Great numbers of people were out of work, and prices rose higher and higher. Most people struggled to buy food and other necessities. The price of flour and meat doubled between 1835 and 1837. Even coal, the fuel people used to heat their homes, cost two times as much. Violence finally broke out at a protest meeting in New York City. Some in the crowd demanded action against the rich traders. About 1,000 people marched to a store, forced their way into it, and destroyed large amounts of flour and grain. Businessmen blamed the government for the economic depression. They said the biggest reason was a decision former President Jackson made. Jackson's order required the government to accept only gold or silver for government land. Opponents said the order had caused fear and mistrust. Even some of Jackson's strongest supporters said it should be lifted. They said the measure had done its job of ending land speculation. Now they said it was hurting the economy. Two of President Van Buren's closest advisors urged him to continue the order. Lifting it, they argued, would flood the federal government with worthless paper money. Van Buren was troubled. The federal government had already lost $9 million because of bank failures. The president wanted to make sure the government had enough money. And he wanted this money safe until needed. Yet he did not believe the federal government had the responsibility for ending the depression. 
And historian Joel Silby says Van Buren did not believe the government had the right to interfere in any way with private business. He said that over and over again, that the federal government doesn't have the power to do this. Mr. Silby adds that Van Buren's political philosophy grew out of the beliefs of former President Thomas Jefferson. All of his life, Van Buren claimed to be a Jeffersonian Democrat. That had very specific meaning to him. Limited government, uh, freedom for people, meaning white males. He was an egalitarian within the limits of those years. Van Buren also shared Jackson's suspicion of bankers. In general, he believed no group, neither the government nor the wealthy, should have too much power, not even to help the economy. So Van Buren decided to continue Jackson's order. No government land could be bought with paper money. The American economy got worse. The president called a special meeting of Congress. In a message to lawmakers, Van Buren said, overbanking and overtrading had caused the depression. He proposed several steps to protect the government. One of them was for Congress to pass a law permitting the government to keep its own money in the Treasury. America's Treasury Department received money when it collected import taxes and sold land. It used this money to pay what the government owed. The Treasury did not, however, hold the money from the time it was collected to the time it was paid out. The Treasury put the money in private banks. President Van Buren wanted to end this custom. He wanted a law to let the Treasury keep government money in its own secure places. The Whigs criticized Van Buren for thinking only of protecting the federal government and not helping businessmen, farmers, and the states. Some Democrats, who believed strongly in states' rights, also opposed Van Buren's idea. All these opponents provided enough votes in Congress to defeat the proposal. Van Buren tried again the following year to get approval for an independent treasury. Again, the proposal was defeated. Finally, in June 1840, Congress passed a law enabling the Treasury Department to hold government money itself. Van Buren signed what was called the Independent Treasury Bill. But the economic depression continued. Martin Van Buren also faced an international challenge from a surprising place. I'm Steve Ember, inviting you to join us next time for The Making of a Nation, American History, from VOA Learning English. That's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.